Okay, class, welcome to the next lesson in Eureka Math Module 2. This time it's lesson 11. All about something called congruence. Congruence is a word we've used before in Module 2. So you should not kind of know what it is. You should have be familiar with it. So this is, this is practicing and trying to figure out some rules about congruence today. You'll need pages 115 to 126 from your Module 2 workbook to follow along with us today. You also need the blank piece of paper for your notes and all the tools that we've been using for Module 2, like your transparency, a straight edge, maybe some different colored pens or things if you want to be a little bit more organized and creative, and your dry erase marker to use with your transparency. Make sure you have all these tools ready to go. So let's talk about what we've done so far. So far in module two, we've learned about the three rigid motions, translations, reflections, and rotations. We we've spent 10 le lessons studying those. You've taken a couple quizzes about those in one mid-module test. Now, so you should know what those three rigid motions are. You should be able to describe them to me, and you should be able to perform them, do them, using your transparency. You should know how to do all of those, translations, reflections, and rotations. If you are confused about any of those things, you need to schedule a meeting with me so we can do some one-on-one -on -one training, because you might need a little bit more coaching because it is important you know how to do translations, reflections, and rotations for the rest of module two. And today, using the three rigid motions, we are going to use them to prove congruence. Going to use the three rigid motions to prove congruence. And you can see that I have the definition of congruent right there. Well, it's my definition in my own words. I hope it's easy enough for you to understand, but congruent means that figures have the same size, and the same shape. You've heard me say that before in other lessons. Congruence means the same size and the same shape exactly. That means it has to be the exact same shape. It cannot just be a triangle. It has to be a triangle with the same sides and the same angles. It has to be exactly the same. Same size, same shape, exactly. That's what congruent means. There's even a special symbol for congruent. I think I used it in a previous lesson, but just in case you forgot, that is the symbol for congruent right there. It's an equal sign with a little wavy line on top of it. So it's an equal sign with a little wavy line. That symbol means congruent. So if you ever see that symbol in a math lesson, it means congruent. If you want to write congruent, but you don't want to spell the whole word because the word is uh, congruent is nine letters long, congruence is 10 letters long, this means the exact same thing, probably just easier to write, but that is the symbol. And you will see the symbol in your lessons, you will see the symbols on your quizzes, on your tests, and I will be writing the symbol. So it's important you know what that symbol is for the rest of module two and even, I think, into Module 3. So what we're going to be doing today is checking to see if figures are congruent. And we know that figures are congruent if rigid motions can map one onto the other. So the way you prove, the way you know something is congruent it is if you can translate, reflect, and rotate to put one on top of the other one exactly. That's one way to prove congruence. If we can use the rigid motions and only the rigid motions to make the two things line up. So the way you know something is congruent is if you can use the rigid motions to make them align to make them line up, to map one onto the other. So rigid motions work. Something is congruent if rigid motions map it onto the other one. 
So those are the notes for today. That's what we're working on today. We're gonna to do some experiments. We're gonna be testing. We're gonna be proving congruence by moving some figures around. Proving congruence by moving figures around. So uh, take a minute to pause, take a minute to look at your notes, to get settled, maybe get your supplies together, get the workbook in front of you so that in a, just a few seconds we are gonna start working on lesson 11. Okay, now that you've had some time to look at the notes and get ready for the day, Let's go to page 115 where we're going to start. And actually, we're going to use these three odd-looking shapes. I don't even know what you'd call that shape. But we're going to use them for all of exercise, for three parts of exercise one. So we have these three shapes. We have, and I'm just going to use different colors. We have S1 right here. We have S2 in the middle. And we have S3 right here in the bottom right. S1, S2, and S3. So uh, I will tell you right now, all three of these are congruent. They are the same size. They are the same shape. They are just in different places. So we are, they are congruent, but I would like to prove that they are congruent. And the, remember from our notes, the way we prove they're congruent is using rigid motions to map one onto the other. So we're going to use some rigid motions, make them line up, and if they line up, it proves they're congruent. So for part A, the first one says, describe the sequence of basic rigid motions that shows S1 is congruent with, there's our congruent symbol, I told you it was going to show up, to show that S1 is congruent with S2. So we need to make, so we need to show that S1 is congruent with S2. So we're not even going to worry about S3 right now, we just need to move S1 to S2. So what rigid motions do we need to do this? Uh, and remember, we're going to describe the rigid motions. So let's, I got my transparency. Let's explore a little bit. Let's experiment a little bit. Let me take my transparency and I'll trace S1 on it. I'm going to trace it in red. There we go. And now I need to play around and try to make it line up with S2. So, and in my mind, I'm thinking about my rigid motions. So I slide it up, I translate, but translating by itself is not enough because that will not make it line up. What if I translate, I slide, and I spin? I translate, and I rotate. Well, that doesn't line up perfectly. It's facing the wrong direction. If you look at it, it's facing the wrong direction. So I need to translate, slide, spin and rotate. And then when it's right here, I need to flip and reflect. And that makes it line up perfectly. So again, translating was not good enough translating and rotating was not good enough. I needed all three basic rigid motions. I needed to translate, rotate, and flip my, flip my transparency, reflect. That works. So now I just, I figured it out with my transparency. Now I just need to write down the steps. And there were three steps, if you remember. I had to do three rigid motions. The first thing I did, remember, I translated until the tips were touching. So I did a translate first. After I translated, 
I had to rotate, I had to spin. So step two was rotate. And then finally, when the two shapes were back to back, I had to flip it, I had to reflect it, so they line up perfectly. So the last step was reflect. So that is the sequence I need, but I'm not exactly done yet. And you should know I'm not done yet because of lesson 10. When we worked on lesson 10, I said, naming the rigid motion is only half the job. You need to tell me the rules. And so you need to tell me the rules. So when we translate, the rule is, remember, a vector. So I need to make the vector that I translate on. And remember, I followed what I did was I followed from one tip to the other tip. So I'm going to make a vector that follows that path. So I'm going to use my straight edge. I'm going to line up the tips of the figures, and I'm going to say that is my vector. I'm even going to label with points. I'm going to say point A, point B, so that my vector has a name. So I say translate along vector A, B. So now I have the motion and the rule. Motion, I have translate with the rule. Now I need rotate with the rule. So for rotate, what point did I spin around? So I follow the vector. And for rotation, I need a point. What point did I spin around? I spun around point B until I got there. So I need to say that I rotate around point B. So I have the rigid motion and the rule, the rigid motion and the rule. Reflect, I still need my rule. So to help me with this, I'm going to make point C up here. Because after I translate on the vector, I rotate around B. I need to reflect. I need to flip. What do I flip over? I flip over a line. So I need to tell you what line. So if you look, I am flipping over line BC. That's why I put a C there, to give the line a name. So I'm reflecting over this line right here. So I reflect over line BC. And that's the answer to exercise one, part A. The three rigid motions that prove the congruence. So now I know S1 and S2 are congruent. I proved it with my rigid motions that put one right on top of the other one. So that's why we use rigid motions, to prove congruence. And so these are the three steps with the rules, and that's all the information you need. You need all of this information so that anybody else can see and understand what you did. So that's activity A. What I'd like you to do is on page 116 is going to be the same thing, except this time it's asking you to prove that S2 is congruent with S3. So you don't need S1 this time. So we're going to ignore S1. I'm going to just cross it out. You just need to prove that S2 and S3 are congruent. Tell me what rigid motions will prove that. So take a minute, pause the video, and try your best at part B, and then come back to the video, and we will talk, and we will see if your answers match my answers. Okay, hopefully you took some time to do part B on your own.
Uh, let me show you how I would solve it. I would want to explore with my transparency just to confirm. So I'm going to trace S2, and my job is to move S2 onto S3. So looking at this, a translation will not work because they don't line up if I just translate. Also, a, uh, I don't think I have to flip because if I flip, then the little half circle on the top is facing the wrong direction. I think all I need to do on this is I need to slide. I need to translate. And then it looks like if I just spin, it'll get there. So a translate and a spin will get there. OK. So my first step, I need to slide down to translate. And then I'm going to rotate until they line up. But again, that's only half my answer. I still need to uh, have the rule for my translation and my rotation. To do the translation, I need a vector. So the easiest vector I see is I'm just going to connect the two points. And I'm going to follow that vector. And because I want to give the vector a name, I'm going to give both ends of the vector points, so A and B. So I'm going to just say translate along vector AB. So now I know I translate, and I showed you my rule. And then, so, so that's what I do. I, first thing I do is I translate and slide and stop at point B. Now I need to rotate. But remember, for rotate, you need a rule. And the rule is around what point. And if you look at what I'm doing, I'm spinning around point B. Point B does not move. Point B stays in the same place. So I rotate around point B. So, and that is how I prove these are congruent. So I know S2 and S3 are congruent because I can translate and rotate to put them on top of each other. And that is how you prove it. You use rigid motions to prove congruence. And I now I know the size and the shape stay the same. That is page 116. We got one more exercise to try with this. That's on page 117. And this time, they're asking you to prove that S1 is congruent with S3. So this time, we do not need S2. So take a minute, pause the video, see if you can prove we practiced part A, we practiced part B. Try part C. Can you move S1 over here on top of S3? What rigid motions do you need to use? So pause the video, try it, and then come back when you're done and see if, you, if your answer matches mine. Okay, hopefully you took some time to work on part C. Let me show you how I would do part C, and you can tell me if uh, you and I did the same. So I'm going to trace S1. I really need some thinner Expo markers. I got the fine Expo markers. I think I should have got, like, the ultra fine or whatever. How am I going to move S1 onto S2? Well, let me just try... It's far away, so I'm just going to try to slide. OK, sliding didn't work. Sliding, it's, it's not lining up perfectly. So let me try a slide, just a slide. And even a slide and a flip won't work because it doesn't line up still. So, so, I mean, maybe if I play around with this, I need to slide and make the points touch. And then let me try spinning. Let me spin. OK, I can spin. And now my S1 and S3 are back to back. 
but that's still not proving congruence because proving congruence means they need to be exactly the same, not back to back. So I, I translated, I rotated. Last thing I think I need to do is flip it and reflect. And yep, that lined it up perfectly. That makes it line up perfectly. So this one actually needed three steps to make, to prove the congruence, I needed three steps. First thing I did is just to get the figures close to each other, I translated. And then if you remember, so I, so I translated to get them close. And then you'll remember that I chose to rotate until they were back to back. So step two for me was to rotate. And then finally, back to back was not good enough. So I flipped it over. I reflected. But again, just telling me translate, rotate, reflect is not good enough because honestly, anybody could guess that. You could just type in all three, you could just write down all three of those and you could guess right. To prove you know what you're doing, I need the rules also. So remember, when we translate, we follow a vector. So again, I'm going to do a point at this tip and label that A, a point at the other tip and label that B, and I am going to connect them and show you my vector. So I translate along vector A, B. So now you know I know what I'm doing. I did not just guess translate, I wrote down the rule. And then when I rotate, so after I translate, I'm here, I rotate. What am I rotating around? What stays in the same place? Point B stays in the same place. So I rotate around point B. And then my last step was reflect. I have to flip. So what I need to reflect over a line. What's the line going to be? Well, I know one side of the line is B. So let me name the other side of the line C. So this in green right here is line B, C. And that is what I flip over. Reflect over line B, C. And those are the three steps. Hopefully you got the same answer I did or something similar that also worked. If you want to know if you, if you got something different and you want to check it with me, please share it with me so I can check your work and see if you got it right. Because there might be another way to do this. This was just my way. Uh, let's go to page 118 for exercise two, the last exercise in this lesson. And uh, it tells us to perform the sequence of a translation followed by a rotation of figure X, Y, Z. Okay, so the sequence, we're going to do two things. The first thing is a translation. We have to do a translation first. And then rotation, we're going to do second. So we have to do a translation and a rotation. So you have to do two things to this figure, figure X, Y, Z. So you know how to translate, you know how to rotate. Uh, let's see what the translation rule is. Okay, so the rule for the translation is vector A, B. So that's, excuse me, the rule for the translation. And the rotation is going to be D degrees. That means you can choose what how much you rotate around the center O. So you're going to have to translate using this vector, rotate around O, and then label your new figure. So why don't you try that? Why don't you take some time, why don't you pause the video and translate this following the vector, and then rotate it around O and label. After you do all that, you can start the video again, and we will talk about uh, congruency.
Okay, so in exercise two, they gave us X, Y, Z, and the first thing they wanted us to do was to translate. Remember, translate was step one, and then we rotate. So when we translate, we follow the vector. Now, if you remember when I've translated before, whenever I follow a vector, I like to make sure I stay going in the same direction. So I like to add my pink dotted line to make sure I follow the right direction. That way I know when I start sliding, I'm always going the same direction. Now, let me get my transparency. Let me trace what I need. So I need my vector, which is right here. And I trace it exactly so I know exactly where I need to stop. And I'm going to trace my X figure X, Y, Z. I'm going to use a different color. I'm going to use blue. And I'm going to label on my transparency X, Y, Z also. Now what I need is all copied. So let me start the translation. I'm going to follow the vector, and the pink line helps me stay in the same direction. And I stop exactly at the end of the vector. So I follow the same direction on my pink line, and I stop until the vectors are just touching exactly. That was step one. Step two was a rotation around O. So now I need to label point O right there. And I'm going to spin around that point. So it could be, you can, and they told me I could pick however many degrees I wanted to spin. So I'm just going to start spinning, and I'm going to stop, let's say, I don't care, let's stop right here. Now again, you can stop wherever you want. Now the trick part, remember, is to get your pen and kind of sneak under the transparency. I just try to label X, label Y, label Z. And then when I move my transparency, I just connect the dots the best I can. Remember, being precise, being exact is important. So when I say the best you can, I really mean the very best. Now, the top right here is kind of curved like that. And I think that mine looks pretty good. I'm kind of happy with that. So there's X, there's Z, there's Y. So that's what my translation and rotation look like. Yours should look similar. The only difference might be uh, you might have rotated a different number of degrees. But now the question is, right here, is XYZ congruent with XYZ prime? Are these congruent? Well, yes. XYZ is congruent with XYZ prime. And how do I know? Because rigid motions moved XYZ to XYZ prime, and rigid motions keep congruence. So that's my explanation. I used rigid motions, so I know they have to be congruent. Because anytime I use rigid motions, I they keep congruent. So I know. Oh, forgot to label my primes. Should fix that. I know that XY right here equals XY prime. I know that xz equals xz prime. I also know that this angle, angle x, 
equals angle X prime. I know all of these are equal because they are congruent, and that's what congruent means. So hopefully you got you understood that. Hopefully you have a good explanation. You do need an explanation. Telling me yes is not good enough. I want you to be able to explain how you know these things. Uh, page 119 is next. That's the lesson summary. Just telling you about congruence, about how segments stay the same and how angles stay the same and all those kinds of things. And it even reminds you about the symbol for congruence. And then page 121 is your exit ticket. We're going to slide that to the back because that's going to be the last thing you work on today. You got the homework helper on page 123, which is another problem example where they explain how they did things in the boxes. So if you get stuck on the homework, look at the homework helper. Page 125 is your problem set, 125 and 126. So let's look at these to give you a little bit of an explanation about this. Number one, we have two triangles. Is there one rigid motion that will map them onto each other? Can you move this over here with one rigid motion? Can you do it? And remember, explain. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up here. The answer is yes. There is one rigid motion that will do it. Can you figure out what that rigid motion is? For number two, are these two congruent? And if they are congruent, how do you move one onto the other one? So I want you to describe this. Just like we did for exercise one today where you listed the rules, I want you to tell me the rules for number two. How does this one move over here? Or how does this one move over here? I want you to tell me those rules. On page 126, they, now you have two rays, ray OA and ray OA prime. And then there's two parts, part A. How do you map OA onto OA prime? So what are the rules? How do you move this over here? And for part B, how do you go back? How do you move the prime back up here? Again, I want you to list what rigid motions you use, and always when you list a rigid motion, tell me the rule that you follow with it. When you finish the problem set, remember that my answers will be posted online. Check your answers with my answers so that you know, so that you can make sure you know what you're doing. If you think you and I just did something differently and you have a and we have two different right answers. Contact me, reach out to me, and we can check to see if we if you have a right answer and I have a different right answer. That could happen. Well, after you check your problem set, the exit ticket on page 121 is what you'll do last. Number one is asking, are these triangles congruent? If they are, tell me the rigid motions to prove it. If these are congruent, tell me the rigid motions that prove it. Number two is the same thing. Are these congruent? If they are, tell me the rigid motions that prove it. Tell me the rigid motions that prove it. For both number one and two, if you say they are not congruent, explain how you know they are not congruent. So if they are congruent for both these questions, tell me the rigid motions. If they are not congruent, tell me why. Tell me how you know. So that's the lesson for today. Use your transparencies well. Have some fun with it. And if you have any questions, remember to reach out and contact me so that I can help you. Have a great day. I will see you for the next lesson.